Before we uh, move on to the next lecture, let me uh, kind of recap uh, what all we did yes, uh, last, last week, lecture number 10. Uh, most of this is self-study from the chapter 3 of Razavi, but I am just highlighting a few points, uh, you know, different types of modulation, analog modulation techniques and then we talked about digital modulation techniques, okay, QPSK and uh, we talked about what is the advantage of all these different things and uh, QAM. Uh, OFDM, we talked about orthogonal uh, frequency uh, division multiplexing. Then we took an example of uh, Wi Fi AG, and then um, the one of the important pieces we talked about was uh, um, PAR, which is peak to average ratio. Why is it important? Then uh, various multiple access, techni access techniques uh, TDD, FDD, FDMA, uh, TDMA, and CDMA. Um, and then uh, some of the frequency hopping uh, CDMA discussion. Then after that we went into transceiver architecture, uh, which is what I am going to continue today. And um, I want to cover few things today and then get back to build the base for architecture so that you get a big picture. But we won't dive too deep into it in the sense that we will only study one architecture uh, in the beginning. And then uh, then later on, um, if time permits, then I will uh, take additional, uh, you know, uh, additional classes, and then um, then we can we can go over the other uh, other architectures. But once you understand fundamental for one, then you will. Uh, I want to uh, empower you you with fundamentals. So some of the extra things I'm going to do today is basically fundamentals, so that you understand how to process, um, uh, you know, as a picture. You know, uh, how do you how do you process IQ signals and those kind of things. Then we talked about uh, you know channel select filter and um, you know why you cannot uh, why you cannot uh, at RF why you cannot just filter the channel. But instead what we do is we, we select the band first and then we select the channel. It's kind of like a coarse and fine um, treatment. Okay. Then we talked about down conversion. Um, so down conversion basically what you are doing is by mixing you are shifting the frequency down so that you can do filtering more effectively okay? and that basically reduces the Q of the circuit um, since we are shifting down shifting and then we went through some uh, uh, heterodyne receiver um, what happens there and then image problem we talked uh, at length about image problem, image reject filter why is it important then we and then we started on the direct conversion receiver 0 IF or homodyne. Receiver. So let's. I'm going to recap this a little bit more because that's what we're going to spend most of the time uh, today uh, on that one. Okay. So in the direct conversion receiver, uh, we are directly down converting to from RF to DC. Okay. So the LO frequency is same as the RF frequency. That's why it's called HOMO, which is the same. Uh, dyne being the frequency. Um, and then um, so what you do here is uh, initially you bandpass filter to remove. Uh, remove like a really um, you know far away uh, far out um, interferers after going through the LNA you, you using a mixer you down down convert um, using a low frequency okay and then you only have to do low pass filter. So uh, what I highlighted last time was um, uh, the advantage of this is absence of image. Uh, then there is channel selection that happens at baseband using a low pass filter. So these low pass filters at baseband frequencies are very easy to design. There is no external filtering required apart from this band pass filter which which has uh, which can be uh, you know created using simple LC structures uh, not uh, like a complex soft filter which has a really high Q. And then uh, since uh, everything is on chip after the LNA uh, you are not going outside the chip like the previous case. Uh, superhead cases. So uh, here um, it is integrated interface between LN and mixer and then you can optimize for gain, noise figure, linearity. You do not have to do 50 ohm matching because you are inside the chip now. And it is the best approach for integration and fully programmable receiver that is what we talked about. Okay. So let us talk uh, continue this discussion today. Let me redraw the
So, this is our I and Q signals and then after that we basically go into an ADC and the rest of the magic happens inside the digital DSP. Okay, let us call this uh, point X. And let us call this guy Y and let us call this guy Z. So, we will do some simple math, math here. So, at X, uh, what do you have a Vx T cos of uh, omega Rf T plus phi T. So, the information can be in amplitude or as well as it can be in the phase, ok. We do not know that yet. And then at y, what are we doing? We are multiplying this by cos of uh, omega, omega L O T. So, V x T omega L O T times cos of omega R F T plus phi T. Just for simplicity, I am assuming. Um, um, omega L O T phase is 0, but you can derive the same expression with, with the phase, it just makes things a little bit more complicated and you may lose insight when you do that. So, I am just doing it for convenience. So, what is this equal to? Half of uh, V x T cos and cos is two causes, right. So, cos of omega L O minus omega R F T minus phi t times um, plus sorry cos of omega L O plus omega R F t plus phi t ok. So, since omega L O equal to omega R F for 0 I F, uh, what do we get here? Half of Vxt and you get cos of phi t. Cos of minus phi t is same as phi t, right? And on the other side, you get plus uh, cos of uh, 2 omega L O t plus phi t. So far clear? So, um, if you remember this picture, right, you can see my cursor, right? Uh, the filter is going to filter out this term, ok because it is at twice the omega L O frequency. We are only interested in the low frequency. So, what you would eventually get at I would be half V x t cos of phi t. Is this clear so far? Ok. So, similarly, we can prove that at Q, you can do exact same type of analysis, you will get half of V x t sin of phi t ok. So, this is what is going to the demod, um, demodulator in the digital right. So, the there are various algorithms, uh, the commonly used is cordic algorithm and what you do there is uh, digital, if you do i square plus q square what are you going to get? Huh? square root of that half V x right. So, this is the amplitude at uh, R f input and then if you do tan inverse of uh, q over i negative, what do you get there? You will get pi of t. So, this is a phase input. So, that is kind of the way you, uh, you can with a simple math you can explain this, uh, how this thing works. Let us do a little bit, uh, little bit um, now I like to use the spectrums. So, it is easier to understand. Huh? 
omega l o equal to omega r f ok they are the same. So, So, let us do the spectrum here which is um, let us say this is the desired and there is stuff around it right. So, there is a square like this and let us say there is a large signal triangle like this. Let us keep since this is a real signal I am going to put uh, So, these are whole bunch of um, um, channels in a band and we are trying to uh, do down conversion and then the this is the RF frequency, this is, this is the desired guy, okay. this is RF input and then we are multiplying it by let us for example cos omega L o minus omega L o. Okay. So, I output is when you multiply what happens? Um, you multiply one tone with another tone, what do you get? We did in um, IP, uh, uh, you know, when we did intermodulation, right? You get addition and subtraction. So, take this whole thing and then you move it the, this way and move it that way, right? So, then you are going to get this and you are going to get this and you are going to get this. Okay, and at the same time, I'm going to get uh, plus. So it's going to look like this, like this, and like this. Does that make sense? With this omega L O part. And now let's take this negative part. So here, what's going to happen? You're going to get. Um, okay, so here, what I'm going to get is I'm going to get this, this. And then I'm going to get a black here, and I'm going to get this, and I'm going to get a triangle here. Okay. And then when we use a low-pass filter, what do we do? All we do is we just get rid of the rest of the stuff. The key point is low-pass filters are very easy to implement at even low frequencies, right? Because it's all at base band now. Um, whereas if you're doing at high frequencies, you have to implement a band-pass filter with a very high Q. So that's the beauty of uh, uh, direct conversion. Okay. So um, while doing this, um, so this is uh, channel uh, select low pass filter. Okay. So I kind of cheated while showing you all this stuff for a reason because I wanted to take a baby step first and then take a more complex step. So so this is not exactly accurate. Okay. Um, if you if you remember, uh, if I kind of cheated by showing you this symmetric waveform, uh, symmetric uh, spectrum. If this spectrum was not symmetric, then it will get garbled up. Okay, you'll get plus and minus frequencies. So I'm going to come back to this um, in at 6:30. Okay, from 6:30 to 7, we are going to focus on some more fundamentals. Okay, but till then, I want to finish. Uh, uh, rest of the discussion on di direct conversion uh, receivers. Okay, so what are the? All this stuff looks cool, right? And uh, uh, then you would think that this is kind of obvious. You know, why didn't people do it from t equal to zero? Because all this stuff, the direct conversion receiver. Um, actually, I was uh, one of the team members for the world's first direct conversion transceivers implemented. If you remember those radios that the, I showed you the first time. Uh, those were done in 1994 time frame and then um, we uh, in Motorola we were working working on basically all the problems that you are going to see is what rest of the world also saw and they said you know it is not worth it to fix all these problems. But with CMOS improvements uh, you know you, there, you could do a lot of jugad to fix all the problems and finally uh, you know get, um, get the cream or the butter they say right. So, um, so we are going to go through all those things and basically logically understand uh, what are the issues and how do you solve those issues. 
and similarly every other architecture have their own set of problems but then uh, what finally matters is for a particular implementation which one works best for you okay so the first problem of the of the direct conversion receiver so um, I am talking about problems, but I think you are convinced about all the benefits of direct conversion, right? Because we dealt with uh, the image frequency issue and then how it leads to solutions which are not really integratable, you know, because you have to have this external filter which is somewhere in the IF region, all that good stuff, right? So I think that part is clear. So now, after having seen all the benefits, we are going to look at the negative parts, okay? So I uh, oh, okay. So you, your question is about this bandpass filter, right? We talked about this bandpass filter, right? Okay. So let's take an example, right? Let's take an example. Um, you are um, you're you're trying to do um, pick pick uh, pick an application. You are trying to do um, even your cell phone for that matter, right? So you're detecting signals which are really really weak, but then there is somebody else who's totally outside the band. It could be your microwave. It could be uh, it could be uh, a transmitter um, which is on a rooftop, which has really really high amplitude. Okay, so all these guys are far away from your frequency of interest, but they will come in and they will just rail out your sensitive circuits. No, hang on, hang on, hang on. A very good point. Okay, uh, so what will happen is even before you get to the low pass filter. All the previous circuits will get rolled, uh, railed out, like LNA output, the mixer output will get uh, clipped. Okay, so for that you need some kind of initial protection. As I said, there is a coarse filtering and the fine filtering, and the coarse filtering purpose is done by bandpass filter. Now this bandpass filter is there no matter where you go, uh, because you just want to weed out everything that's outside your band of interest. See, there are two things we are talking about: channel and a band. Right, so channel is the narrow channel within a band, and you are interested in the whole band, but you don't want anything else coming outside from outside the band in and clip your circuits. So the bandpass filter merely protects, uh, you know, the other circuits from from getting uh, clipped. The other, of course, what is the other reason? Very good, you guys are picking up. Okay, good. Uh, if you don't have that one, then the noise will also get through, and you have to consider that noise. The so noise figure will suffer. Okay. Is that clear? Huh? You don't seem convinced. Okay, all right. Okay, so the first challenge is um, LO leakage. Somehow the leakage word doesn't sound appetizing, right? Whenever there is a leakage, I've never seen leakage to be beneficial. So what's going on here? So if you if you remember our um, design, you have LNA. And you have a mixer, and you have this LO, right? Okay. So we haven't studied mixers yet, but take it from me that um, mixers are basically um, you are you are switching signals from one side to another, right? You are just chopping back forth, back forth, back forth, right? So you need strong signals at the output of the LO. Because you have to turn on and turn off, turn on and turn off transistors. So for that, you need large signal. So the signals here are pretty large. Okay, and then what happens is there is there is some kind of cap from mixer LO port to the RF port, and of course there is some kind of capacitance from the from the LNA output port to the input port. These are all parasitics. When you lay out circuits, you'll have either you'll have device capacitances, or if you're really poor layout, then you'll have capacitances due to routing. You know you didn't do a good job of routing things. So these are the things you have to take into account. I'm showing you all the negatives, which means that when you're doing your layout, RF circuits is all about layout. So it's like 20% design, but maybe 60% is all layout. How you lay out the circuit? Because you may think that it looks, you know, circuit is performing well, but then as soon as you lay it out and you extract the uh, this, the parameters, uh, extract the layout, it will not. It will show you, you know. What's going on? Basically, you'll have all these parasitics included. So here, what's going on is you have these capacitances uh, all over the place, and even though they are small, right? This signal is large, so then it's going to leak out through the antenna. That signal. So you become, even though you are a receiver, you become a transmitter for all these LO signals. So
yellow coupling to antenna. So, one, one reason is device caps and the second reason big reason is the pad. So, the pad is, is a big plate right. So, it has a capacitance to substrate. So, since this LO is in the same substrate no matter how much you isolate right, you will have some something going uh, some garbage going to the other side of this cap and it can also leak out ok. So, the through the substrate is another one. So, what this will do is it will desensitize. in same band ok. So, how do you fix this? If it hurts do not do that right. So, you 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 try to minimize these capacitances you want to do really good layout and you want to choose topologies which have good um, basically reverse isolation. So, that is the way to do it and there are various techniques to shield and provide good grounds and you try to keep things symmetrical all the way throughout that way you can minimize it. So, this is the first problem. Huh? Hmm. No matter how much uh, you know all that is going to do is provide additional isolation, eventually it will go out and generally the requirements for this uh, leakage or, or rather a spur they call it antenna spur, LO spur are very very stringent. So, uh, that is that's, that's the reason I am just showing you one simple diagram to show the, the mechanism. All it will do is if you have a TX switch right as you said it, then you will have additional isolation at this point maybe 20 dB at the most. So, then still it does not cut it as you will see through the example I am going to go through ok, but good question. So, second problem that or a challenge that plagued uh, direct conversion receivers for the longest time is DC offsets and you will see what I what I mean by that. So, let us say you have um, Typically, you have multiple stages here of amplification, filtering. Uh, for the same reason, if you remember, you know, we are trying to manage IP3 as well as uh, noise figure, right? So, doing everything in one stage is generally not a good idea. You want to, uh, you know, st step them through. So, these are all variable gain amplifiers, let us say. Ok. So, now let us. Uh, so, what happens is that the, the LO leakage that is been that is going through all the way to the antenna ok, it can reflect back and come right back ok, uh, through, uh, through the LNA port because there is nothing preventing uh, it from coming back. And then you can get like a DC component because now LO omega LO let us say there is no no RF frequency coming in ok and LO leaks to the antenna. Now, it comes right back again and it mixes with itself and gives you DC term because LO mixing with LO right. Now, the other thing is that there could be changes in how you orient the transceiver, how the reflections are coming back and forth all those kind of things right. Then what will happen? The value of the DC will keep changing it will be slowly varying DC change right. So, what will that do? it is right in band because we are interested in DC to certain frequency right and DC uh, there is information at DC. So, this will corrupt your incoming uh, whatever you are trying to demodulate. So, let us take an example here um, which kind of will make the point. So, let us assume that this part is AV is equal to 30 dB 
okay and from here to here let us say uh, this is an ADC right. So, typically the AV numbers is like say 60 dB and let us say that the LO leakage uh, at the antenna is equal to I mean it is pretty small number right 60 dBm. So, let us calculate the impact of this such a small signal on our receiver. So, A V 1 is equal to 30 dB. So, what is that number? 6 dB is factor of 2. So, what is 30 dB? Huh? Which is 32, right? So, that is kind of the way I would like you to think, uh, you know use these uh, fun, like 6 dB is factor of 2, 10, um, you know you have to keep those in your head factor of 10 is 20 dB. So, A V 2 is equal to this is A V 1, A V 2 is 60 dB. What does that mean? Huh? 1000, right? 10 is 20 dB. So, 1000 is uh, 60 dB, right? So, uh, now let us talk about minus 60 dBm. What is that equal to? 0 dBm is 1 milliwatt. So, minus 10 dBm is 0.1 milliwatt, right? Correct? Okay, so, do this thinking. So, 60 dBm is 10 to the power minus 6 milliwatt, okay? So, 1 E 10 to the power minus 6 milliwatts. So, what is that V p square divided by 2 times 50, let us say 50 ohm circuit is equal to 1 E minus 9 watts. So, that gives you V p is equal to 316 micro volts peak. Does that make sense? It is just um, you know numbers at that point. All right. So, let us see at mixer output, what do you see? V uh, leak DC offset is equal to 32 times uh, 316 micro volts, right? Peak is equal to, no, yeah, about 10 millivolts of offset right there. And at ADC input, what do we see? Offset is equal to 10 millivolts times 1000, which gives you 10 volts, right? So, you can obviously see this will, would you get 10 volts? No, you will not. You will, uh, it, it will saturate because your supply voltage will be like 1 volt or so. So, this will uh, saturate somewhere in the middle you will get saturated and then it will just it will look like a digital circuit at that point okay so you can see how important this uh, dc offset issue is okay the other issue uh, that you also have is i mean i only talked about the lo leakage piece right but there is another issue that you have all these um, all these circuits right at the baseband okay so till this point when you are in the high frequency region um, you can do ac coupling right because you are at rf you don't care about dc there but once you come down to baseband it's all dc that you're processing right so from here to here it's all dc going through now all these circuits that we are designing we are designing with real transistors they are like differential pairs op amps and all that good stuff right so process mismatches they will cause offsets so 10 millivolts of offset is given no matter how well you design any op amp you will have 10 millivolt of offset and when you have so many of them, you will have some offset coming in at the input. So, that itself will kill kill the path. Okay? So, now you can see why this will not work if you do not do anything special. Right? You can manufacture this thing, but, but if, you, if you cannot get rid of this DC offset, then uh, the, the receiver will not work. Okay? Is this part clear? Uh, the fundamental this is like the fundamental issue with the with the with the direct conversion receivers 
it is an example I just picked a number. So, even if you go to minus 80 dBm right this number will go down by 20 dB is still no good. Even if you go down to minus 100 dBm you will still see the problem right. So, that really depends on uh, so few things I am going to go through the solution just bear with me for a few more minutes because I am going to talk about the solution. Uh, so, okay the point I was trying to make uh, before we jump into the solution is there will be mismatches and there is nothing you can do about it okay in, in your entire uh, baseband pack and all those things are going to multiply because you have such a huge gain uh, to, to boost your signal right. So, then, then it is going to clip itself and then you will not be able to uh, get anything out okay. So, what do we do? So, solutions. So, first thing people did and I remember we did this on our very first 0 IF receiver okay. So, it was AC coupling. Right. If AC, if DC hurts you, then don't use DC. That's kind of what you do. So then, then what do you do? You have a LNA, let's say, and you have a mixer. Then what you do is you do some kind of, uh, and then you do the filtering. Okay. So this will provide a, a high pass structure. Okay. I'm just showing you a figurative way of how to do this the exact circuit will not look like this okay. So, what are we doing right basically when we down convert you were expecting to get this particular uh, the whole spectrum brought down right, but with this AC coupling you are going to try to do notch out the DC okay that is what will happen. So, um, this AC AC coupling will introduce a notch at DC. Is this part clear? Right? For, yeah. Of course, yes, yes. That is a problem. Yeah. So yeah, I am coming to it. Okay. So what we'll 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 do is just to make it work, um, you notch out DC. So this solves one problem, which is incoming LO leakage problem, right? Which was time varying and all that good stuff. So, we got rid of it, but then uh, if you have any information at DC, we are in trouble just like he said it, then it would not work right. The other thing is um, other negative thing about this. So, if you, you can, you can do this is where all our DSP knowledge comes into play right. So, uh, the neg one other negative part here is a slow response. I think you probably guessed that right. Why is it slow? Because I am just trying to notch the DC. So, I really have to tighten this uh, corner high pass corner to as low frequency as possible. It could be kilohertz, it could be even hundreds of hertz right. So, then anytime there is a change you will have a slow settling okay. It will, it will react to anything slow and then for that much time your receiver is out of action okay. So, that is uh, that's the negative about this. So, even if you change LO, if you change any of the gain settings or for that matter uh, anything changes in the environment. So, all those changes will, uh, will give you a slow reaction. Now, some cases it might be okay. Suppose you are doing some sensing extremely low power sensing where you do not really care the transient time right, uh, then it is okay, then you can make it work. So, the commonly used uh, solution let me use a new page is, is DC offset cancellation. So, what do you do here? So, imagine this mixer to be having a differential output okay for a minute and then you put these resistors as load resistors. Okay, and then you go into your filter circuits for that matter and then you go into your amplifiers blah 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 and then finally you get into the ADC. For example, I ADC and Q ADC right. So, what you can do is this is the beauty of integration CMOS okay. CMOS gates are free. I mean you uh, gates are like glue you can throw as many as you want and do some kind of processing in digital and get the information you want and you correct your analog circuits. So, that is the that is the main reason RF CMOS has become 
extremely popular. I mean, most of the stuff that you do around, right? Um, in 2000 time frame, when uh, people were talking about RF CMOS, right? People would laugh at you. I mean, they would think that RF and CMOS don't go together. But now, if you're not doing RF CMOS, people will laugh at you. So things have changed so much, uh, and all because of um, all the all the issues that you have, you fix them in digital. That's the that's the logic. So. Uh, you have an architecture that's really, really, um, you know, you amenable to integration, low cost, and all that good stuff. Insensitive to all sorts of problems, right? Then it has these these issues, so you fix them in digital. And how do you fix them digital? Is one example that I'm going to show you. So what you do is um, ADC has all the information, right? ADC is just sampling uh, the com output coming. So if it's railed out, it knows that there is an offset. So all it, all it has to do is it has to do correction signal. So then you add a DAC here. D2A converter. I think many of you are taking the the other analog class, right? Mixed signal analog class. So you're doing DAC design. You're familiar with DACs, right? Basically, DAC is uh, inverse of the ADC. So with the, whatever digital bits you give, it will produce an analog signal. So with the DAC, you can actually correct this, and the the information comes from the ADC. ADC will will tell you. I'm just showing you a simple way of uh, how do you do this. Okay. So what's the advantage of this, right? You will say that, oh, this is going to work only at one frequency or it may work only under certain condition. How do you do this? How do you fix this, right? Uh, or you could say that this processing is happening, it's such a big loop, it's going to be extremely slow. It's going to have a very slow transient time. All that stuff is true, right? But CMOS, right? So you can record everything. You can do all the calibrations. You can, uh, when you are powering up, what do you do? You set out certain tones here, okay, at the input. Um, so you you create certain frequency spectrum of frequencies and they don't have to be really really accurate. Um, you send them out and then you measure the uh, measure your DC offsets at certain uh, certain places, right? So you, sorry, um, not DC offset. I'm getting I'm, I'm I'm jumping ahead of myself. So what you do is under all conditions you um, you calibrate this out and then um, you store that information the DC offset, okay? And then um, once you store it, you can open this loop, right? So if you open the loop, what happens? There is no filtering action anymore, okay? So we have canceled. If you remember this part earlier, the reason this happens, this uh, happens because you have a continuous uh, filtering action, low pass filtering action. But here, what I'm going to do is, in this case, I'm going to sense that there is an offset and I'm going to correct for that offset using a DAC. And once I know the offset is corrected, uh, then I will break the loop. Basically, I will have the the offset value stored in the memory, and then I will uh, I will most many most of the offset will come from this piece, and that's not going to change much except for the temperature. But whatever is incoming offset or incoming LO feed through and all that stuff, that will keep varying. So whenever that varies goes out of bounds, then the ADC kicks in and it puts out a new value. But you can store everything in digital, and that that helps you. Substantial in in this, okay. Correct, yeah. DC from DC point of view. So it's kind of whatever input referred offset at that point you're correcting it, and all it's doing is it's you 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 push the DAC signal so much that the output comes right in the middle. Very simple, okay. So the benefits of this, I'm just putting it down. Basically, you can do power up calibration, and then you can do. Uh, it's fast reacting when you're using stored value. And when you're using stored value, you're not notching anything, any information at DC also. So the question you asked, right, you are going to notch out information at DC, that doesn't happen. Only happens temporarily when you're uh, calibrating. And the DAC and digital circuits, right? Support circuits. I mean, they are um, extremely uh, small size compared to the huge cap that you need to put for that previous case. So the the only thing you have to watch out for is a DAC resolution. Okay. 
is that clear because it, it, you can only correct as much as the DAC resolution. So, uh, it, whatever is residual will still go through. So, you have to account for that. So, let us imagine this wakes up right and first thing what are you going to see? The ADC will be one rail will be up the other rail will be down right and then you start mucking around with your DAC. So, you, you start taking steps and then till till it hits the center and then you know that is the calibration value. Very simple that way. Is that clear? Okay. No? Any other question? Okay. It again depends right. I mean yeah correct. Once it is corrected you will correct a major part of the offset and there will be some residual offset that you will you will see. So, typically what happens in all these digital systems right. You always have um, there is a data time, receive time and then there is a quiet time right. So, you can always sniff in the quiet time and then make the corrections. So, you do that you do major part of the calibration first and then if you see there is necessary is it necessary to due to temperature change or something else happen then you do that. So, you always have some time to take uh, take action ok and this is not the only calibration you do. So, I am going to come to a lot more. Um, you could if you change the channel then you will have something different. So, you have to store all that information and it is again you know CMOS you can do whatever number of points you want correct yeah frequency dependent. So, these there is a ROM in which you store uh, you know versus frequency whatever versus channel whatever offset I am going to have and you store it there and you just access that. Because the key thing is once the receiver is up right typically in all the transceivers like especially high performance transceivers what you have to do is there are stringent specs on how much time you have from power up to uh, I mean not power up, but you come out of idle state or a, or a state in which you are uh, sleeping ok. At power up you have a lot of time when you first time turn on the power you can take as much as you want ok to do all the stuff. But then once that part is done then typically the transceivers are powered down and then they sniff and wake up go down and so th if you do keep doing that then you save a lot of power right. So, if you take a lot of time doing calibrations then that is going to eat into your uh, how much power you use uh, for 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 your receiver. So, that is that is an important aspect. So, what do you do because uh, so, so you want to save power under those conditions. So, you record everything in the beginning and then you just throw those values uh, whenever needed uh, and digital is smart enough to do all these things and this is like routinely done ok. So, this is uh, this is not something that is new anymore ok. So, the next thing is um, uh, even order distortion ok. So, imagine this same transceiver I think you have already studied all this for your exam right I would imagine. So, it will be all fresh in your mind cos omega L O T and let us imagine a spectrum here that looks like this. So, this is the desired ok and then I have two tones right next to each other like this or you can imagine anything not not just this way, uh, but I am just giving an example. So, so the, the LNA will have its second order nonlinearity right. So, then what do you get here? You will get the difference between these two tones you will get a uh, this is 0 and this will be let us call this uh, f 1 and f 2 and this is our desired. So, f 1 and f 2 what you will get f 2 minus f 1 is that does that make sense because of the second order right. Second order nonlinearity will you give you what what frequencies? plus minus. So, you will get um, f 1 plus f 2 which is at very high frequencies and f 2 minus f 1 which will be at very close to DC. So, you will get this and then um, we ignore the other piece because that is not relevant and then at the same time you have this desired information which is uh, actually amplified because of the LNA right and these two tones these are buggers also here ok. Now, what is going on on this side uh, from from the LO side 
we are going to take this spectrum and we are going to down convert right. So, this would be our omega r f and omega r f equal to omega l. So, what will happen you will get at d c you will get So, this is after omega l o with this they mix together right and you are going to get at d c omega l equal to omega r f right. However, there is something called um, feed through through the mixer because it is bunch of devices and it has some capacitances there will be mismatches and all that good stuff which we are going to study when we go to mixer design ok. So, you will see part of this will leak through this low frequency stuff and it will show up right here which is f 2 minus f 1 ok. So, this will corrupt and the main reason for that is second order nonlinearity of L n A and for that ma matter mixer also can do the same thing. Only thing is at the output from R f port to the output port of the mixer ok. So, for I mean for that matter see this this input is also going to be at the mixer input right and it will have its own uh, second order performance. So, it will also show up again in the same location ok. So, this is what you have to be vigilant about all these things because you may construct something that will work only under certain condition, but then once you start looking at all these effects um, you will start seeing all these uh, non idealities and they will basically uh, make your receiver unu unusable. So, how do you fix this? The best way to fix any kind of second order issues is by using differential circuits ok. And they differential circuits you will improve your IIP too. However, I mean conceptually if you have a differential circuit right then there should not be any second order component conceptually. However, in real life mismatches they will come and kill you right. So, you have to just make sure your layouts are perfectly symmetrical and routing is perfectly symmetrical and any kind of coupling that is happening in that path is also symmetrical and once you do that then you can get reasonably good results ok. But still IIP 2 is not infinite for uh, for uh, symmetrical circuits uh, differential circuits. The fourth thing is flicker noise as you have guessed you have again a mixer. So, this in the spectrum what will happen you will see something like this right. What is this frequency called? Flicker noise corner frequency and what does that mean? Huh? So, uh, so, so what is going on is you have uh, a flicker noise you have 1 over f noise and you have uh, your thermal noise. So, whenever they equal they are equal that is the flicker noise corner frequency. So, um, the mixer will have at the output of the mixer will you will have flicker noise for again you know for uh, what will happen is in various paths you will have uh, imperfect cancellations as well as the flicker noise of the devices right. So, that will show up at the output and that again will increase at DC right because it is it is a flicker noise and then on top of that you have your desired signal like this. So, your signal to noise ratio figuratively speaking at DC is going to go kaput because of the flicker noise right. So, also one more thing if you remember uh, when we did the flicker noise uh, discussion what happens with process scaling? flicker noise gets worse if you remember right. So, flicker noise so all these things start uh, start coming into play. So, the effect is very similar to uh, similar to DC offsets and uh, mixer 1 over f noise dominates. Why is that? 
why doesn't the LNA 1 over F noise come into play? Exactly. So, LNA, LNA uh, remember at the LNA 1 over F noise is at DC, right? And the L, signal that LNA is processing it as RF, right? And with mixer, what you are doing is you are down converting everything, but along with that, the mixer's 1 over F noise is also coming out and it is corrupting your required desired signal. So, what you do is basically you focus on mixer design so that this 1 over F design, uh, noise is not a problem. One more thing just to give you an insight uh, that I have done before is, um, is chopper stabilization. I will explain just in a minute in this. So, I do not think have you heard the word uh, chopper stabilization? Some no. Okay. So, let us just I mean it is good to know all these terms because when you go out there in the industry you know you sh if you know chopper stabilization people will look at you like and this guy knows his stuff right. So, remember now it is really really simple the name is fancy chopper means you chop something right that is all we are going to do. So, you let us imagine an amplifier right and so, the amplifiers offset V offset let me use a new page so I can show you better. I am just representing uh, offset of the amplifier okay, as VOS here plus minus. So, once I have amplifier constructed and it is operating the offset voltage is not changing okay, at a given condition that is given. So, then um, I am if I start using from input to output you will if I just use this as plus minus and minus plus right you will you will suddenly see offset coming out right. So, now the trick is you can if you have a clock some kind of clock coming into the system right and you are not using this signal continuously right then you can you can say that for positive edge of a positive uh, portion of the clock I am going to look at this amplifier one way for the negative portion I am going to look at it another way, but I want to make sure that my signal that is coming out is always correct. So, what do you do? In one case you use the signal like this. So, let us say phi 1, phi 1 I think you are getting the hang of what I am trying to say here right phi 1 and phi 1. Okay. When I use apply the input you will see positive sees the offset positive input sees the offset. So, let me draw is phi 1. Okay. Now, in the negative phase of the offset I switch and I switch here also in the negative phase of the clock or let us call it another uh, actually I should just use 5 and 5 bar just for clarity. Let me do this again. Okay. So, phi bar, phi bar is the middle. So, in one case I am I am going through this path where offset is is presented one way, in the other case I am just flipping input as well as output. So, if you flip input and output uh, what will happen the output should not change right because the signs are all preserved everything. You will only have a glitch when you do the switch and that glitch may not be important if you are processing DC signals. Is that clear? No? It is not clear. Okay. Let me see how I can explain you. So, let us uh, let us take a number example right. Let us let us imagine that uh, I, I use op amp uh, or whatever amplifier and let us say this is 5 millivolts right uh, plus 5 millivolts. Then um, if I if I if I go this way like this okay. then what you will see is you will see this 5 millivolt offset multiplied by the gain right. So, you will see 5 times A in this phase okay. and in the other phase when I when I go through this way and this way what you will see is minus 5 millivolts times A. Is that part clear? Bipolar meaning a device? Yeah, yeah, it is a differential input. 
differential input correct correct yeah so so you have a you have a box let's say okay plus minus minus plus so you have a differential output then the gain is a let's say okay and input referred offset of that box is some um, v of off right so all i'm saying is that once you once you know the offset that offset remains the same the sign doesn't change the value doesn't change once you manufactured it right so then what i'm going to do is in one case i'm going to use this box as is so i'm which means i'm going to apply positive negative here and i'm going to read out negative and positive here okay so the positive signal the v offset will go in series with the with the positive output okay and uh, it will show up with certain gain so you will see let's say a v offset at the output input is still zero okay now the other time i'm going to change this and i'm going to say this is minus and this is positive and this is plus and this is minus okay now what happens is that the offset voltage is now applied in the reverse fashion and what will happen is you'll end up getting minus a v offset at the output I think that's a subtle point you have to realize it. No, still not. Some people it's very obvious, but some people are still stuck. But maybe I shouldn't even be spending time on this because this is something that's a little bit, um, little bit advanced in that sense. So anyway, the point I'm trying to make is when you do this, right? So um, how do you do that? You can you can have switches. You can have switches like this at the input and output. Okay. So during phi. You connect the connect this circuit here like this, and during phi bar you switch just with CMOS switches, right? Okay, is that clear now? Now it's obvious, right? So during phi bar you you change the inputs and all that stuff we can do, right? CMOS switches are perfect, and uh, so then what happens is that the output what you will see is that your signal whatever is there it, it will always show up correctly, okay? But you will see a switching waveform plus a v of minus a v of okay constantly tick tock tick tock according to the clocking that's happening and what's the beauty of that huh it's not at dc we translated that offset signal into high frequency at half the clock rate whatever happening right Huh? Yeah, but input doesn't get bothered by this, right? Imagine the input path. All you're doing is switching. So input C is go straight through. Input doesn't get bothered because all I'm doing is I'm switching outputs and inputs at the same way. No, input cannot be same as offset voltage. No, you cannot. Right? No, no. It doesn't matter what value of input is. The way the structure is done. The offset voltage is presented differentially, but input voltage, it's always um, it doesn't see that effect. Uh, write, show, write it on a piece of paper, and you'll see the effect. And uh, so this is what is called chopper stabilization. Okay, so you use this in extremely low uh, low offset uh, op amps and things like that. Okay, so the same technique, you know, I had proposed that we should use it for uh, mixers. And uh, you can do that. You can do uh, so. The advantage of this is not only your offset goes away, but your one over f noise also moves. The effective one over f noise input referred of this circuit will also move to the clock half clock rate. Is that clear? Okay. I mean, it's a slight leap of faith from DC offset, but generally DC offset and one over f noise they are treated similar way because they are all happening at low frequency. So same thing you can do with the mixer design so that you can you don't have trouble with flicker noise. Okay, let's move. Then you don't care, right? Then you filter it out because you are always looking at your DC signal, right? So um, by by doing this chopper stabilization, you you push out the stuff, uh, your bad stuff at high frequency. That's what you do, and then you filter out and it doesn't come into your signal path. Of course, complexity is is uh, comes into play, and you want to make sure that things match when you're doing this switching business. So quickly wrapping up, um, that has been plaguing uh, uh, the zero IF transceivers. So here, what happens is 
Now these mixers 90 degrees and this is your LO coming in and this is your RF and your filter. So imagine this right from your LO all the way to the output and LO to this output right there is going to be gain and phase mismatch because of practical circuits right. So there will be gain and phase mismatch here. Is that part clear to you or uh, you are just accepting because I said so. So which means that the gain in one path is going to be slightly different than the gain in other path I mean just manufacturing variations and all those things right and especially phase is extremely sensitive because that is the phase delay in two paths is going to be definitely different because there is a 90 degree uh, phase shift in between it will not be perfectly 90 degrees. The other part is here also you will have gain and phase mismatch. So all these things what they do is if you remember the constellation diagrams even for the simplest case right you will start skewing them which means you will have some fuzz around all these guys okay because they will start moving around with all these gain phase mismatches okay and especially if they are varying quite a lot okay. So then that that takes a toll on your bit error rate. I am talking in high level right now but then I will uh, you know you can study the effect in detail if you want to. Uh, so what you do in this case again just like a DC offset calibration you do power up calibration. Yeah, Again this is routinely done this is IQ mismatch correction. Now this is frequency dependent so you have to do it at multiple frequencies depending upon your um, you can use it do it at various tones by putting in uh, various tones at input okay and tones are easy to create because you can you have a synthesizer you divide down the signal and you know you choose various divide ratios and you can create tones. So all that stuff happens at power up and you store information versus temperature versus uh, frequency versus uh, different gain settings all that stuff I mean there is tons of data that is recorded on the chip which you won't believe how much it is I mean it is all in the memory okay. So it is all to make sure that this thing works okay and early days this the DSP was not residing on the same RF chip right. So then it is kind of hard to do all these things there is a separate DSP chip and there is a separate analog RF chip but now everything is on one chip. So um, you do not the user does, does not even see, see it I mean he sees the performance same as a discrete part performance which you will be really good you will see it with the chip because all these uh, uh, defects have been all corrected for. So typical um, uh, digital correction right after digital correction you will see uh, I mean you will do that at demod also all these things after you do these things. And then you would see uh, like a gain uh, and phase of uh, 0.5 dB to 1 degree. Now that's pretty good if you if you can achieve that those numbers uh, for high performance uh, receiver. Okay. So the last one I'm going to be really quick before we jump onto the new topic is LO pulling. I just wanted to introduce you to so that you know what it is. So what happens is um, it is not just the LO that is the bad guy right you can have an um, on channel signal really really large uh, suppose me and him are talking but he is he is transmitting at a really high power because his receive, receiver is far out there okay so he is going to transmit really high, high power then that, that, that particular really high uh, RF input can come in and leak to the LO and it will uh, it will modulate my LO okay and once you modulate the LO then whatever you are demodulating will also get affected. So that is what is called LO pooling. So strong RF signal will modulate LO. So RF to LO isolation is important here yeah. so you have to focus on those also. So despite all these challenges as I said again DC a direct conversion transceiver is one of the most popular approaches in the recent times and purely because uh, it makes everything integratable and programmable okay you do not have to worry once you do get rid of the image problem then everything can be done in DSP okay. So I am going to take uh, 
to take a small deviation and I am going to uh, talk about quadrature signal processing. So, this is something that uh, you know if you want to do there is a website called DSP guru as usual and then there is a person called Leons I really like him. So, I picked it up from him I mean his uh, literature there. So, um, it is nothing nothing um, you probably have learned all these things in your other classes, but I just wanted to put it together so that it all kind of fits nicely. And the reason I am doing this is because this will be foundation for all your spectrum processing that you are going to do, because you will be doing different types of transceivers um, and you have to develop this skill of looking at the spectrum, complex spectrum and that is all we are going to do. Okay? So, it is all fundamentals if you have probably done your DSP and you are really confident then this will be piece of cake for you. Okay? So, basically um, in world right you know, whatever numbers that we are measuring they are real numbers temperature voltages they are all real numbers, but then when we go to complex numbers suddenly you get scared right. I used to I do not know about you guys, but uh, so that is what I am trying to demystify here. So, what is complex number? So, we say complex is actually uh, um, it unnecessarily makes you think uh, that it is complicated it is not okay. it is just a different way of looking at things. So, and on top of the that the added confusion is real and imaginary right. So, that is what we are going to get into and um, okay. so let me. Uh, so, what is a complex number basically it is a two dimensional representation of a number I think all of you know that right. So, what we are saying is if this is my real axis and this is my imaginary axis. Again, the real and imaginary have no real meaning. Okay, it's just a convenience. It's, you can call it i axis and a q axis, and it's the same thing. Okay, but unfortunately, we call it complex. We call it real and imaginary, and you get messed up as soon as uh, you say that. So let's let's go back to basics again. So if you have a complex number, how do you represent it? There is one um, uh, re rectangular form. C is equal to if this is C and this is A and this is B, right? How do you represent it? A plus J B, right? And in a, a trigonometric form, how do you represent it? C is equal to M, which is this M, and let's say this is my theta. Then you say M cos theta plus J sin theta. Is that clear? I'm going to go really fast because I have to cover this uh, something quickly to give you some insights. And then the polar form. What is the polar form? C is equal to m e to the power j theta that is what we talk about right. So, so this basically when you uh, m is equal to if you if you equate the two is equal to c then you get a square plus b square. Okay. This is something we looked at some just some time ago when uh, when we were trying to do the cordic algorithm right? and phi is given by tan inverse of b over a. Okay. So, far you are with me right. So, the Euler's identity what is that it is m times nothing but m e to the power j equating the two is equal to m cos theta plus j sin theta. Okay. So, the identity is basically e to the power j theta is equal to cos theta plus j sin theta. I am talking going to talk about the j part one more time and e minus j theta is equal to cos theta minus j sin theta. Okay. So, um, what is this j operator right? Can anybody explain? What is j? Huh? e to the yeah ok. So, uh, j is equal to square root of minus 1. That is what we keep saying and you know I used to get I mean you know why minus 1 why square root right. So, let us uh, let us go back where this j guy comes from right I mean intuitive way of understanding this j dude. So, so let us say you take a number 1 and you multiply it by j what happens you get j right. So, so then uh, let us draw that on the complex axis let us say 1 is represented here right and then uh, when I multiply it by j what happens you go to this right j. So, just from this one example what is j operator? 
90 degree rotation in the anti clockwise direction. I think that is the key thing. If you know that, then you are almost on top of it. Okay. If I multiply one more time by j, what happens? This will come down here, and that is why the j is equal to minus 1. That is where the minus 1 comes from. Okay. It is all convenience of angle rotation. I think if you are clear about this part, then you are halfway there. Okay. So let us move on to and then if you do jj again, you will come back. I mean, you can try it out yourself. So multiplying any number by uh, um, any number multiply by j, what do we do? 90 degrees rotation. So j is also equal to e to the power j pi by 2, which is again uh, counterclockwise uh, rotation. So let us represent um, real signals using complex phasors. Okay. So um, I want to uh, represent cos um, cos of uh, 2 pi f t. Okay. Now whenever um, instead of theta I am using to f t right 2 pi f t what does that mean? That means with time that angle is changing right. So if I had just cos theta then you would just have one point but if you have 2 pi f t meaning with time the damn thing is moving around and then it is moving as much as the rotation and with uh, uh, in one rotation you are rotate you how much are you rotating 2 pi. Right, that is where the 2 pi comes from, 2 pi radians. Okay. So then uh, now if you are with me here, then um, e to the power, we just said that j is equal to, sorry, uh, if you just take one point for example, right, then, uh, then this is going to be uh, e to the power j 2 pi f t. Okay. And the other point is going to be e to the power minus j 2 pi f t. So, e to the power j 2 pi f t is rotating in this direction okay? and e to the power minus j pi is going to rotate in that direction okay? because uh, the theta angle is going opposite and when you look at the effect of both on the real axis. Okay? So it will start from when t equal to 0 both will be on the real axis is that, is that clear? So let me draw a picture here, which basically I will draw horizontally, I like to draw it this way, 0 and this is my uh, real axis. So if you, if you see, you, at 0 I start here and this is my time. So at 0 I am going to start here and then as those phasors are moving around, you have to look at the projection of them on the, uh, of, on the real axis. right? So what is going to happen to that projection? At t equal to 0, it is going to be the highest. And at t, whenever they reach the, the center, it is going to go to 0. Is that part clear? The, the phasors are rotating and we are looking at their projection on the real. So the real, this is the real signal, cos theta that we are drawing. So what is cos theta then? Cos of 2 pi f t is equal to e to the power j 2 pi f t plus e to the power minus j 2 pi f t divided by 2. Is this part clear? You have to visualize those two phasors uh, rotating and look at their projection on the x real axis and then this is what it comes out to be. And similarly, we can do the sine part. So in sine part, you want to move things differently, right? You want to start from at t equal to 0, you want to start from here because sine is 0 at, um, at t equal to 0, right? So you start from here, but then you want to rotate in this direction, right? Is that clear? So that as the at, as t goes increasing, then the this thing will go up and will go down like this. Is that projection part clear? Okay. So if you are with me there, then then this is going to be e to the power minus j two pi f t because it needs to rotate in that direction. Okay. And then on top of that, I, it was here before and I moved it here, so I have to multiply it by j. Is that clear? Because when you multiply it by j, it goes by uh, by 90 degrees in the clock that direction. Similarly, this guy becomes minus j e to the power uh, j 2 pi f t. Okay? So then if you do the projection again, you will you'll see this thing. And then you can say sin 2 pi f t 
is equal to what is it j e to the power minus j 2 pi f t minus j e to the power j 2 pi f t divided by 2 ok. So far everybody is with me or is this totally not making sense? I want to hear good, bad, useful, not useful. Uh, okay, so then uh, let's um, let's draw these. Um, now I want to take this to frequency domain because that's where the real fun begins. I mean, we just scratch the surface uh, by doing a time domain. So what happens in frequency domain? So if you if we do this right, so in frequency domain uh, in in time domain, this is what we were saying. This is my time and this is real and this is imaginary. Is this diagram clear to you? What I am drawing? This is cos of 2 pi f t ok. So then when we do uh, our Fourier analysis right, this will look like again this is real and this is imaginary. You will see this is 0, it is kind of a funny way of drawing but it, it makes sense and this will be uh, the two tones will be sleeping like this, there will be f c and minus f c and this is 0 ok. Is that clear? This is our cos of uh, 2 pi f c t ok and now let us do the sine the same way. So sine wave is going to look like this right, right it starts at this but then when, when you look at the sine wave in the frequency domain what happens? Go back to the previous expression which we just did. This is the expression, right? So, what is that expression saying? e to the power j 2 pi f t is that at uh, on the real side, and when you multiply that j, then you can draw this here like this. This is 0, and this is my f c, and this is minus f c, ok. So, and this is frequency, and this is real and imaginary. Okay. So, from the previous expression what you will see is if you just look at this you will see um, the 2 pi minus j 2 pi f t is positive ok. A lot of people do not know that but actually this is positive ok and then this guy is actually negative going down ok on this imaginary axis. All I am doing is I am just representing these, um, these identities on the frequency spectrum ok. So, this is what is happening uh, when you represent numbers this way. Now, when we talk about our um, e to the power j 2 pi f c t, right, we say cos of 2 pi f c t plus j of sin 2 pi f c t, ok. So, here is the insight, ok. When I multiply this, so we take this we are taking cos as is and we are taking sin and multiplying by j ok. So, what happens then when you multiply by j 90 degree shift. So, then what happens is this guy rotates this way, this guy rotates this way ok and then it is going to look like this. I am going to draw on top of this like this and then when you add these two together what will happen? This will get cancelled, this will get cancelled and you will get the twice the value on this side. So, they added the, the only the positive frequency part will add right makes sense. So, then what do you get? This is why you get this e to the power j 2 pi f c t by doing that makes sense ok. So, let us move on to now the real thing that we were trying to do i q processing. So, I had to do all this thing so that I can get you to listen to the rest of it. So, now, now that it is clear to you, if, if I start with this then it would have gone just over your head. So, that is why I had to do these few steps. So, we are talking about quadrature signal processing now. So, if you look at the real um, bandpass signal. ok. Again I say I use the word real that means uh, if you have a real signal that means you have both positive and negative frequency spectrums as you saw right um, and then uh, like cos theta or cos 2 pi uh, uh, 2 pi f c t 
or sine 2 pi fct right they have both positive and negative spectrums it's only the complex complex uh, spectrum which will have only one sided spectrum which is real or uh, on the positive or negative right uh, so the real bandpass signal is going to look like this let's say so i'm going to draw in frequency i'm going to draw it with an angle here so bandpass because you have so many tones so i'm just going to draw that box that box basically is all these tones okay like this so it's at certain angle theta like this right so then you will have a projection of that on this axis do you see that and then you'll have a horizontal projection okay since this is we are talking about real and imaginary okay and then similarly you will have on the negative side of the frequency this is zero you're going to have a something that looks like this that piece the second piece and there you will have a projection that that's on the real axis like this and you will have a projection on the bottom like this okay now is the moment of how they cancel out right you can see the the positive part uh, is in line and the negative part is like this right so a complex spectrum is going to look like this simply you will only have like this that's it so you will have both complex it will be one sided this is f equal to 0 and then uh, this is the bandpass spectrum okay so now the other rule of the equation is that if you if you take any signal x of t and you multiply it by e to the power j 2 pi f 0 t then what happens you shift okay so you upshift by by f 0 and if you do e to the power minus j 2 pi f 0 t what do you do downshift so we know that right so what is our goal when we do all these iq processing right so um, you may have a spectrum that looks like this which is what we have been dealing with but this is not what we want finally when we capture in dsp what you want is this you want it cleanly to be captured and that's what we are going to figure out how do you do that using iq processing because this is very easy to process by dsp and that part I think is from your DSP class. I'm not going to get into that. Okay. So you want to sam once you sample it, then you'll have all these. Uh, if you remember all these images, right? I think does that sound uh, familiar? Sampling rate changes and all that stuff, and filtering in DSP. Okay. So that stuff happens in DSP. But our goal is to to get from here to here. Only this guy. We don't want this second guy coming into play, and we don't want anybody. Is brothers and sisters which are already hanging around there we don't want any of them we just want that guy main guy okay for processing the picture i wanted to show you was um, uh, the same as what we talked about if you take and then adc so now it will all put together uh, in your head this is what we have been talking about right how do you do this so this in this case this is cos 2 pi f c t and this is sin 2 pi f c t okay and this is uh, x i t let's say and this is i t this is x q t and let's say this is q t and this becomes i time n because it's sampled and this is q n okay so now this is our x bp bp means bandpass okay all right so the original signal let me draw uh, okay now it will be clear is right here this is our fc minus fc okay so then i multiplied with the uh, cos 2 pi fct what is cos 2 pi fct again like this right so um, let me just draw them here you will have one tone here like this one tone here right 
So then what do you do? You now intentionally I am showing you that okay and then this guy shows up here is that clear to you and let me draw this other guy in dotted terms is this clear so, so you saw how i was fooling you with the other example that i gave you the first time because they were looking symmetrical you thought everything was cool but actually it's not if you just look at the cost this is what you'll get so it'll be all mangled up signal because it will have its own own image on top of it okay so this is what you get with the this is real and then this is um, happening with uh, cos 2 pi f c t. This is your in phase spectrum. Now the imaginary part, what does that look like? The quadrature part, we are going to take the same signal and we are going to say uh, what is the what is the sign look like down like this and up like this right correct so the first we do this that would give you like this and then you would get uh, this guy which is uh, like this right and then the the negative guy will give you like this right and then this will uh, uh, this will also show up as like this okay. So can you just come in and say that oh cool I am done this is real and this is imaginary because they cancel out and all that good stuff right is that what is going on no remember this is imaginary so this is on a different axis right now okay so we have to again process it further. So that is the key point I do not want you to miss out okay. So let me show you again here. So now let us um, now that we gone this far right only look at this piece now because we know that we are going to filter out the rest right. So let us process this piece one more time and then you guys are done okay. So let us uh, look at the uh, thing here real and imaginary okay. So the I of F what did that look like? because it is on a real axis right. So we said you will have this and you will have a dotted version like this agreed and what is the imaginary piece going to look like? Imaginary piece is going to look like it is going to have vertical like this and it will have like this. Is this part clear? No? Okay. All I did was I took these these things in the middle and I am plotting replotting them in a three dimension so that you you get to see um, q of f okay and in dsp what are we doing we are multiplying this q by minus j okay so you you make it minus j q f t so when you do minus j q f t what happens minus j meaning you you rotate it this way so then what you will get is you will get again this and then you will get something like this. The images are not that, uh, that clear but I think you get the point right if you are following my train of thought. Now what happens is you, you cancel out this piece, you cancel out this piece and then these two add together and that is the way you get the real spectrum that you are trying to do. But I think visually if you can see all these things. Uh, it will stay with you for a long time. So always do uh, hold on to few basics. Every time you want to do this operation, right? All you have to remember is complex number cos theta j sin theta. What is j? 90 degree rotation. And then after that, it's all everything is based on that. There is nothing, no more magic, uh, right? E to the power j 2 pi f c is one side, and then you how you add them together. So then, what is the advantage of doing all this, right? Basically, since I moved the spectrum to the center, right? Now I need to each ADC in the IQ processing is half the bandwidth. Is that does that make sense? Right. So if you have a real signal in general, right? Then you have, if you remember, you have a bandwidth like this. Then you have to have sampling frequency of twice the thing. Now in this case, 
the same bandwidth uh, signal right i am i am uh, i am pushing it around and then i have two of them so i am able to reduce my sampling rate by factor of 2 i can go all the way here till this point um, also the fft processing is very easy and um, very easy to measure the magnitude and phase after you do all this stuff and the demodulation becomes very easy after that. So with that, good luck for your exam tomorrow.